was fortunate enough to pick up a copy of Blood in Their Eyes, the first edition. And uh, it piqued my interest in the Elaine massacre. Little did I know that a few short years later, I would be doing research on it and writing myself on this topic. But I get a lot of questions about Elaine, so I thought I'd make a little PowerPoint uh, to help us uh, along and help me not take up the whole hour. So let me switch over. To understand what happened at the Elaine Massacre, first you must understand uh, what happened immediately after the Civil War. After the death of Abraham Lincoln and uh, two riots in the, city of Mem in the cities of Memphis and New Orleans, um, the South was occupied by Union forces. Uh, with Union forces there, uh, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were passed to the Constitution, uh, giving, ending slavery, giving African Americans civil rights, uh, identifying them as citizens, and giving them voting rights. Under the protection of federal forces, they were able to exercise these rights and were able to even put men into office. However, as a consequence of the 1876 uh, presidential election and the movement away from Reconstruction, two systems of exploitation were developed uh, in the South to return uh, African Americans to near uh, slavery. And what I often tell my, uh, call it with my students is pseudo-slavery. So they were designed to mirror slavery or create uh, circumstances where African-American labor could be exploited. The first of these two systems was called debt peonage, um, keeping uh, farmers, black farmers, in a sense of debt. So keeping uh, records on the ledgers of plantation books, maintaining that they still owed money. And then using local authorities to maintain their presence on the plantation until those monies were paid off. And keep in mind, these monies were never going to be paid off. The debt always was there. The debt was always accumulating. The other form of exploitation um, that was meant to capture labor uh, from African-Americans, once again, was a convict leasing system. So mass incarceration uh, was a loophole in the 13th Amendment that allowed a slavery to exist in the United States as a punishment for crime. This existed all the way uh, throughout uh, the Southern history from Reconstruction till we get to the point of 1917. And in 1917, the United States found itself on the verge of the First World War. Realizing that they would need black troops, um, they very quickly began uh, trying to recruit blacks uh, to join uh, the military. And here we have uh, a recruitment poster, colored soldiers, boys, uh, Uncle Sam, we're coming. Posters of black troops uh, fighting on the battlefield. When we talk about black troops participating in the war, and the initial assessment was that we were going to use black troops as labor. Um, and as black troops went to basic training, they were subjected to uh, discrimination, harassment, and abuse. And then when they got into the theater, when they got over to Europe, um, we, found, we ran into our first problem. And the commanding officer of U.S. forces was General Pershing. And General Pershing was asked to send U.S. reinforcements to the front lines in Europe. But he didn't want to send over um, white troops. He was afraid that if he sent white troops, they would be used as cannon fodder um, and they would suffer high casualties. 
not wanting to separate his white troops, he offered up black troops and uh, told the European officers that they could use them any way they desired to do so. Uh, so black units were at the front of the war and they fought on the front, uh, on the front lines longer than any other US units. The problem began when these soldiers returned home. Uh, believing that they had earned their citizenship, believing that they'd be treated like uh, every, every other white American citizen, they returned home with hopes of that they and their children would share in prosperity and opportunity in the United States. What they very quickly realized is when they returned to their farms and the plantations that they had worked on, that they were being cheated just the way they had prior to their leaving and just as in the same way as their fathers and grandfathers. This image is of the 12 men that were put on death row uh, during the Elaine massacre. These men were all sharecroppers. And each of these men um, decided to join into a union for the purpose of suing, suing the plantation owners that they were working on. So their lawsuits could not be filed publicly. They could not meet out of fear that they would be killed. So what they began doing is secretly meeting in black churches that were in the thickets. Um, we however know, and we'll, we'll talk about this later on, we do know, however, that they were discovered and we know exactly how they were discovered now. There was a big sort of mystery of how the church at Hoopspur was discovered in union participation. But many of these men were um, veterans, uh, particularly uh, one of the leaders of the union, a man by the name of Frank Moore. Frank Moore uh, was a sharecropper on the Archdale farm. In Archdale, had a particular method of cheating the sharecroppers, where other plantation owners only sought to, uh, to steal a larger portion of the harvest from their sharecroppers, Archdale wanted to steal it all. So he would wait until just before harvest uh, time and, and just before the cotton was pulled up. And after it had all been planted, and he would cut off the privileges that sharecroppers had at plantation farms, effectively starving the plantation, the sharecroppers off of the farms. Uh, hungry sharecroppers would desert the cotton in the fields and he would get to claim it all uh, as his own. Frank Moore, being a veteran, refused to leave his farm. And when he became sick, uh, he went to Archdale to borrow money to go to the hospital. Archdale flatly turned him down and he went to his neighbors. And these men in the, these men in the photograph represent not only all the, mem the leadership of the Progressive Farmers and Household Workers Union, they also represent his neighbors. And it was, his, it was his neighbors that lent him the money to go see a doctor. Uh, when he returned to his farm, he decided to open a chapter of the Progressive Farmers a Union. And uh, he believed that collectively, if they pooled their resources, they could find a lawyer that would represent their cause in court. 
What he didn't know, however, was that men would join this union and would feed the information back to the plantation owners. And these plantation owners uh, seeking to end the progressive union uh, decided to send a sheriff's over to the church where they were meeting. Meant to scare, uh, we don't know whether they were meant to scare the sharecroppers or kill some of them as examples, but shots were, were rang out that night and they were shot into the church. Um, the sharecroppers responded by shooting back. At the end of the shooting, uh, one sheriff was dead and another a railroad a sheriff was injured, railroad agent was injured. Um, the men who escaped, the white men who escaped, went to the neighboring town of Elaine, got to the telegraph office, and warned neighboring communities that a black insurrection was at hand. Uh, there was no black insurrection. Not only did they call neighboring towns, um, they called Little Rock, informing the governor's office um, similarly that there was a, an attack underway. The governor's office would contact the Secretary of War and uh, the congressman in DC ultimately getting approval from the Secretary of War to send 500 troops to the Elaine area for the purpose of suppressing the rebellion. We know that the white plantation owners knew of this union and the, re the way that we figured this out, and this is important to the new edition because this is information that wasn't uh, in the first edition. Um, there was a discovery of a cache of records and these records were letters that were sent to the governor of Kansas. Why the governor of Kansas? The governor of Kansas was sheltering the man who formed uh, the Progressive Household Workers uh, Union. And the people of Elaine were writing him to have this man surrendered over to the authorities and put on trial for murder, even though he had never uh, been at this meeting where the shooting occurred. The governor of Kansas refused to send over uh, Hill, but corresponded with a leading businessman, a man, the, a man by the name of Ian Allen, the head of the Helena Businessmen's Association. And in these letters, Allen confesses that he had a friendly black man who was a farmer, he doesn't identify his name, uh, feed him information about the meetings, who was coming, who was going, and where they were meeting. And this is an excerpt from uh, one of those letters. The black informer identified his fellow union men. He identified who the officers were in the union. Um, and this would eventually lead them to Hoopsburg. In the newspapers that followed the arrest of the union men, um, there was a peculiar, peculiar article. And this article was about one man who isn't shot. And the reason that this is unusual is because there were a number of accounts that said that every black man that they saw, every black woman, child, that was there was shot. Anyone that they could see, if they didn't arrest them, they shot them. However, as the mobs were going around the town hunting for black people, uh, 
a, a sharecropper by the name of Isaiah Murphy calmly surrenders himself over. Murphy is described in the article as a good black person in the same way as uh, the informant was described in the letters. And he isn't brought to the stockade like other people who were arrested in the union. He's brought directly before the governor and the press and the historian for the unit, a chaplain by the name of Father Sliney. It's Isaiah Murphy who gives the first account of a revolution on the part of Blacks. And as far as we can tell, he is the first person, the first uh, person who is Black to bring up the topic of a revolution, the idea that Blacks in the Progressive Formers Union were going to take over the county. Another thing that's very suspicious about Isaiah Murphy is they trust Isaiah Murphy enough to let him go outside and smoke a cigarette. While smoking a cigarette, one of the guards sees Isaiah Murphy and shoots him, believing that he is a black man escaping from the stockade. Well, we know that the shootings at Elaine were not about a revolution. In fact, when Colonel Isaac Jinks, the man who led the 500 troops that were sent uh, from the Little Rock area to Elaine, uh, when we read his report, he gives a very vivid account of what he sees immediately after getting off his train. On arrival, we found the town in a great state of excitement. Hundreds of white men, all carrying firearms, were on the street near the station in groups and all over town. We have images of these men that are described by Colonel Jinks. And these men poured in from as far away as Tennessee and Mississippi, from counties throughout the state, all for the opportunity to participate in putting down a revolt that never was. They drank and they shot at every black person that they could see in sight according to some accounts. The first black image, uh, the first dead person that the military will see, and they will run into uh, shortly after arriving. They heard that there was a skirmish outside of town and they made their way uh, to a collection of sharecroppers' shacks. And outside of one of these shacks, they found a woman lying there. Uh, she was barely alive, shot through the throat. And they were not able to save her. The chaplain, Father Sliney, served as the unit's historian and had been thoughtful enough to bring along a camera to record what he saw. And we believe that this is one of the images of the woman who was shot through the throat. Despite the fact that this was painted as a revolution on the part of African Americans in Elaine and in Phillips County, there were only two soldiers uh, that were wounded or shot, two casualties. The first uh, was a sergeant by the name of Pearl Gay. And uh, Sergeant Gay was only slightly wounded. 
The other was a private, a corporal by the name of Luther Earls. And Luther Earls was shot as he gazed into a thicket, so thick he maintained that he could not see inside. As uh, he peered into the thicket, he was shot into the mouth. The shot um, shot off his jaw and he would not survive his wounds. One of the questions uh, that a student asked is if he could not see through the thickets and there were white men all around the town and county running around with guns, shooting at everything they saw, how could he be sure that a black person shot him? Union members were arrested and rounded up, as were all the other blacks in the town. Uh, white plantation owners would then have to go to the stockade, vouch to whether or not the individual that had been arrested could be described as a good black person. And if he could describe him in that manner, they would issue a pass for his release. Uh, union members were kept in jail and tortured to try to elicit guilty pleas. Their wives were arrested, sexually assaulted, and tortured also. We need look no further than Isaac Jinks's report, which is astonishingly brief and gives very, very sparse details on the blacks that are killed. And in it, he maintains on its last page, the investigation into the causes of the uprising revealed the facts that an organization under the name of the Progressive Farmers and Household Union of America had been organized among the, the Blacks. The object of this union were supposed to be better education and living conditions and the absolute equality of the races. Nowhere in his report did he surmise that uh, the Blacks in Phillips County had band together to overthrow the county nor had he uh, made any admission as to uh, their desire to kill any particular plantation owners or do harm to anyone. What they wanted was better education and living conditions for their families. The book tells the tale of what happens to these men and the injustices that uh, they go through in trying to uh, receive a fair trial. Uh, Scipio Jones, uh, the heralded lawyer of Arkansas, will uh, make daring moves, saving them over and over again from execution. He will also, uh, supported by the NAACP, uh, ultimately get the men released, get them clemency and released. Um, another facet of this book is what happens after their release. Um, one of the, the questions, and I had a fantastic history professor, and he said, you should walk away from every book with questions. And he said, that's how you tell if the book's really good. He said, if you walk away with lots of questions, lots of loopholes, um, then that's been a really good history book. You want to go and fill those holes. So I spent um, the better part of four years with uh, Dr. Lancaster, Griff Stockley, Dr. Barkley Key, um, trying to fill as many holes as we possibly could in the story um, in preparation of the 100th year centennial.
hoping that we could provide uh, some answers uh, to questions that people have asked over the last half century about um, the Elaine massacre. Unfortunately, um, well, while we were able to fill some of those holes, there were a great number of holes that are still um, empty, that still need to be filled. So um, I'm sure at, at some later date, um, we'll find out where the bodies of the people who were killed are buried. We'll find out uh, what happened to um, uh, the people who moved away. We'll find out other narratives of families who were there and their experiences. And we will have more accounts at some later date of the horrors that they faced uh, during the week um, of the Elaine massacre. With that, I'll go ahead and pass it uh, the mic. I know I've had it for a little bit, but pass the mic to uh, Dr. Lancaster. All right. Uh, Thank you very much. Um, my comments are just going to be brief. I uh, would like to give some context um, for the sort of the broader picture of the Elaine massacre. That I, I think it's important, and this is, by the way, the 101st anniversary of the start of the massacre. Uh, this this very day, the church at Hoopsburg was shot up on September the 30th, 1919. But I think it's important to recognize that these events didn't, they're not singular events. They're built upon a much larger structure of violence um, that, that, in the case of Arkansas, goes back to the very founding of the state. Uh, that first we have to consider slavery its own system of violence. I mean, it was a, a system of exploitation, uh, of extracting profit from the sweat and blood of people, certainly. But slaves were exposed to tremendous violence, especially, you know, once they were transported in mass to places like Mississippi, uh, Louisiana, Arkansas. The, the, these were places where the, the sort of uh, violent exploitation of, of people of African descent really kind of hit its, its purest form. Um, but aside from the violence uh, within the system of slavery, Lynching gets its start in 1836 in Arkansas, and it gets its start uh, with with the very first election to be held in the state. A free black man whose name is recorded only as Bunch is lynched in Chico County, Arkansas for wanting to participate in the election. He goes to the the polling center is told he can't vote because he's black. Uh, he asserts that he's a free person and has the right and gets in a scuffle uh, with white men there, ends up injuring one of them and is taken out and hanged. Um, that's, that's the first recorded lynching in the state of Arkansas. And there's long been a perception in among historians of racial violence that slaves were not often lynched because of the value uh, accorded their bodies. Uh, you know, one, one would get much, much more profit by, n you know, not harming a slave uh, too excessively. But we found that that's not really the case. Slaves were lynched and Slaves were lynched in greater numbers than one might expect in early Arkansas history. Uh, and all over the state too, in Helena, in Benton County, in Washington County. Uh, I'm here in Little Rock in neighboring Saline County. Uh, there was a lynching of a man named Toll who was an enslaved person. And historians had often 
assumed that more whites were lynched before the Civil War than than African Americans, um, because you know the lynching of whites had occurred, especially uh, along the Western frontier, especially murderers and horse thieves in particular uh, tended to be lynched. But d despite this sort of traditional historical view that lynching became racialized only after the Civil War when, when this sort of uh, traditional rough justice became applied not only to outlaws but to African Americans in general. That's, that's a, a framework that's not holding up. Um, historians are really starting to revise that framework as we discover that more African Americans than previously expected uh, were lynched before the Civil War. And so this, this is part of that continuum of violence. Um, and with the immediate end of the Civil War, uh, that violence begins to accelerate um, as whites, especially members of the Ku Klux Klan that emerges in Arkansas in 1868, start exerting uh, violent oppressive tactics to free blacks. Um, and there's a lot we don't know about this time period. It's the, there's, there's a, a breakdown of, of law and order. Um, there's so much violence going on. There's in fact a letter and it's the the only source we have of this this event. A letter, 1866, describing the mass lynching of 26 free blacks in Jefferson County. Um, we don't know how to evaluate that because we only have this one source. This letter, this this account could be based upon rumor or it could be a description of something that actually occurred. Um, things were so chaotic that without multiple reports of some kind, it's hard to substantiate this. But there are reports to the Freedmen's Bureau, reports sent to uh, Congress and the like, telling of bodies that wash up in a river somewhere, that, that we have so many singular accounts of, of such violence. Um, and that continues on into the Reconstruction era and the post-Reconstruction era when this violence becomes all the more spectacular in terms of it being a spectacle for uh, viewers, for, for, for whites, not only to participate in in mass, but but to view um, that part of the horror of Elaine was this this was a mass spectacle for people, but but you know even more so in 1892, um, a man named Ed Coy was burned to death in Texarkana for having allegedly. Um, assaulted a white woman. Other accounts say that they'd been having an affair for a long time and this was a consensual relationship and that when they brought her out to set fire to him, he asked her, are you going to do this to me, baby? Um, the 1927 lynching of John Carter in Little Rock, 5,000 white residents of Little Rock gathered in downtown to watch the immolation of his body. Um, so what happened at Elaine is part of a, a broader um, spectrum of broader continuum of, of this violence. In fact, in 1891, just north of, of uh, Phillips County, Arkansas, there was a sharecroppers or a cotton farmers strike. Black cotton farmers went on strike um, to protest the wages they were being paid and as many as 15 people may have been killed uh, as a result of that strike attempt. So 
I think it's important to tell the story of Elaine. I also think it's important not to hold it out as an exception of, of our history. Um, that there were race riots that occurred all across the state of Arkansas, all, all across the United States, certainly, but more that happened in the state of Arkansas than we might otherwise know. And I'm going to share my screen here and just, here, hold on. Here at the Encyclopedia of Arkansas, we have an entry on lynching that has um, as you can see, a chart with all the victims we've been able to tabulate at present. And, and many of these you'll see are, are highlighted here because they have their own entries. We're trying to develop entries on every one of these. And if you include the victims of the Elaine massacre in, you know, this tabulation, we don't have it on the chart because we simply don't know uh, the names or numbers of everyone in part, and also there are debates about do you count these as victims of a lynching or this being in part military violence too, is, is that a, a um, different form of violence and entirely, but as, as opposed to the, the mob driven. But anyhow, get off on that, but anyhow, as you can see, if, if you add those in, um, there's something like 492 victims of lynching in the state, and that doesn't include uh, all the people who were driven out of their homes and race riots and acts of racial cleansing across uh, northern Arkansas and western Arkansas. That doesn't include instances of white capping and night riding in which um, white vigilantes would try to drive African-American laborers out of uh, certain industries as happened in uh, Black Rock. They were trying to drive them out of uh, lumber industries in the Washita counties um, or trying to drive them off farms so that they could have those sharecropping opportunities themselves. That happened in Mississippi County in 1915. Um, the forms and uh, levels of violence are much deeper and much wider than we would otherwise imagine, I think. And it is important to document all of this. Um, Dr. Mitchell was talking about filling in those holes. Um, you know, I think if we can fill in these holes, we can really try to create a tabulation of lynchings. We can really try to create the tabulations of these cases where racial cleansing occurred, where night riding white capping occurred, um, we'd, we'd re be rather horrified at the, the um, atrocious nature of our history. Um, so that's what I want to say, and I will turn it over to Renee to uh, give us some questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Guy and Brian. Um, there's there's a, a kind of a back and forth question and comments in the chat about um, the uh, legacy of trauma and being passed down through the generations and um, blacks living in fear of reprisals. We're talking about what happened and even today, that was a comment from Brian. And that, that kind of leads me to, um, maybe it's a multi-part question, but your, your resources for the book and the revised, you know, updated information that you're, uh, you're presenting in the new book and, you know, what were your best resources and how, um, how willing are people to talk about this event, to talk about the massacre, whether they, you know, still live in the region or have moved on, um, if, and if they aren't comfortable with talking about it, then where have been your best sources for getting some of these blanks filled in? Um, our best sources have been archives and we've had a lot of surprising uh, trips and addicts, believe it or not. 
and tops of bookshelves. Uh, so a lot of our, um, a lot of our, and I, I call them journeys or tracks have been very Indiana Joneses. <laughs> uh, we've been uh, to attics and going through attics of museums. We've been to old notary offices that had records just piled up in closets. We've been uh, to other states to look for records. Um, so we, we've, we've found a way, and we found a lot of stuff that people believe they had lost. Um, they believe the records had been destroyed. For instance, if you go to any of the indices, existing indices, and you looked for a black person that died, like the obituary index for the state, that died in Phillips County, what you would discover is for a span of almost 100 years, they didn't have a death. And you're like, that's impossible. You know, this is doing the, the, the Spanish, you know, the Spanish flu. There are lots of people that died. And it was because the Helena Globe didn't record the deaths of black people in its obituaries. So we tried to figure out if the coroner had recorded the deaths of people um, during the massacre. And uh, nobody knew where the coroner's records were. Uh, as we began exploring more information about the coroner, we discovered that his brother was part of the American Legion. And like black veterans that were sharecroppers, whites who were returning joined a brand new organization, um, the American Legion. And the American Legion was the first place that they went to muster up a mob to put down the, uh, the sharecroppers. They didn't have enough officers in Helena. Uh, they called the American Legion, told them to meet them at the courthouse, deputized them all. And they went immediately to Hoopsburg and went to the cabins where the men had been staying to arrest them and shootouts occur uh, that the next morning in the wee wee hours of that morning. And uh, we were able to find accounts of these for the first time, firsthand accounts. And this was extremely helpful. So if you guys want to, I can show you some of the cool stuff that we found because that's what people love to see because it's really, really neat some of the things that we found. So let me share my screen. Uh, let you dig into my digital archive. And this, well, these were the records that we found. We found the coroner's records. The coroner's records had been misplaced. Um, the coroner's family owned a funeral home. So all of the coroner's records for the state had been placed in that funeral home's um, collection. Um, so one of the projects that my students did was to go through uh, a three-year period uh, where uh, the Elaine massacre had occurred and index all of these by cause of death, name, race, a cemetery that they were buried in. And you can learn a lot from these records. Uh, if you take a look at this record, uh, what's the first thing that comes to mind? And first thing that always came to my mind was that how sparse the record was. Uh, died of gunshot wounds. You got to keep in mind, this is a coroner writing this. Died of gunshot wounds. So nothing, black male, married, Dr. D-A-E, and it should be Johnston. They wrote Johnson. Um, he's one of the four Johnston brothers that were killed. Uh, there were four of the wealthiest black men. They were wealthy black, a wealthy black family from uh, Phillips County, and they all had gone squirrel hunting the day before, and unbeknownst to them, this uh, ride, this massacre breaks out, and they're trapped on the way home. They're riding a train, they're pulled from the train, they're taken in the back of a car by a posse, and they end up all dead on the side of a road. Um, they're left there. Their mother, who was coming down from Chicago to meet her youngest son, who had just returned from World War I, uh, hears that her, her sons are all lying in the middle of the road. And she comes back and has to, with friends, 
bring those bodies into the coroner's office. And then they take the bodies and they held them for ransom, uh, requiring her to pay money to get them back. Okay. So that this is one of like the records that we discovered. Give me just a second and we'll see what other sorts of treats are in here. We were fortunate enough to have a governor that was an avid scrapbooker. And as an avid scrapbooker, he kept pictures, photographs, and letters about the massacre. And uh, these are available to the public. I mean, anyone who wanted to go see these records could go see those records. Um, One of the big discoveries was the American Legion Hall Minute Book. So the men that were first mustered up, uh, we found a reference to the Minute Book in an old uh, article that had been written in the 50s. And nobody knew where the record book was. Well, we were able to find the record book in the Dusty Museum uh, attic. And in it is a total recounting of how they were mustered up, a memorials to the members, the two members that were killed. And I don't know exactly how to turn this around, but this is an account of them going out and going after the members of the, of the union. I, I will say with the American Legion record book, um, it, it, it is, that's something that came to our attention because Brian and I had given a presentation at Mosaic Templars uh, and afterwards went out for lunch and a beer with the guy who- The uh, curator. Huh? The museum curator. You're right, the curator at the museum in Phillips County and just chatting about possible other sources that might be out there. And he said, I think I've got something on the American Legion. Uh, I'll check on that. And a few days later, you know, Brian calls me up early in the morning and says, we're going to Helena. He uh -huh. found the record book. <laughs> so you, part of, part of history and doing this research is that kind of random you know, never know who might have uh, what resources. And one of the things we've done, Brian's put together a, a master list of every African American who was charged for with a crime uh, stemming from the Elaine massacre, as well as a membership role of the American Legion and Helena at the time of the massacre. And we've included both of those lists in uh, the book as appendices. So hoping that maybe some descendant recognizes the name of an ancestor there and might have family pic pictures, family letters, or something that can help shine a light on this because the, the history of the Elaine massacre is not complete yet by any means. Um, and, you know, uh, I believe Griff's Griff Stockley's the first edition of Blood in Their Eyes really kind of opened opened the world up to discussing this uh, and certainly opened the world up to uh, investigating this more. And I hope that the revised edition does something similar. Um, you know, hi history is a matter of accreting and 
you know, building upon the work of others. So. Um, Thank you. Uh, what yeah. we've done is we've compiled a, a data set um, and we've been sharing it pretty openly with scholars around the country who are studying uh, the ELA master. We've been sharing it with graduate students, even some undergraduates that are working on some creative projects to try to draw more interest to the study of uh, the massacre in hopes that the more people that get involved um, the more records will, will start coming open. And we do have a wish list of records that we knew existed at some point, but have also vanished. Like we know that at some point, a photographer came down with a motion picture, picture camera and actually took film footage of what was going on. And we know that he sold it to a major uh, theater at the time to be used as like a trailer before movies. And you were hoping that at some point, uh, at some point that information uh, will be discovered and will give us uh, just some more clues to uh, possibly answering some of the other questions that we have. Um, I have a question, and, and Brian, you you touched on um, the Kansas governor not relinquishing. Uh, there, was, there was a Mr. Hill, correct? Robert, Robert um, Lee Hill. Yeah. Do you know? Uh, just out of curiosity, do you know any more information what what happened to him after he left and and went to Kansas? I am working on a article uh, right now on Robert Lee Hill uh, because okay. it's quite interesting. He's okay. given amnesty there, but very quickly, the state puts out a bounty for him. And after two failed kidnapping attempts, imagine being in Topeka, Kansas, getting off of a bus, and then having uh, strange men try to pull you into a car so they can collect a bounty. Uh, he decides he cannot, cannot ever go back to Arkansas. It's just too risky for he and his family. So he, uh, with the help of the governor, gets a job with the railroad under the alias of Smith, Robert Smith. And I have a file on him and we have a lot of records. So um, let me see if I can pull up the information that we have on, 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 on Robert Lee Hill. So these are his employment records. So he was employed by the Atchison, Topeka, Santa Fe Railroad. And uh, we actually have a, a record where he goes to the HR office right before he retires and says, um, look, uh, my real name isn't Smith. <laughs> I, I want you to change my name of my retirement stuff to Hill. And uh, These were all records that were in the files for the railroad company that we were able to put together. And these were also in uh, Kansas. Uh, we also learned a great deal about the NAACP in Kansas. Kansas, despite its reputation now as not welcoming to immigrants or not wanting to be a sanctuary city, in 1919, 1920, 1923, this was a sanctuary. Topeka was a sanctuary city. Everyone was running to Topeka. The man who, the white man who will uh, really save the trial for the Lane 12, a man by the name of Schmidt, uh, his family will run away to Topeka when he's charged. Um, there will be uh, a newspaper editor that is brave enough to be the only newspaper editor in Arkansas to write against the lynchings and, uh, and against the executions of the men. And he will be threatened with arrest and he will escape to Topeka. What was interesting is we found an article in the Topeka Plains Dealer um, that maintained that 200 people from 
the uh, Phillips County area who had been there at the time of the massacre fled there penniless with only the clothes on their backs and were living on the streets and uh, and they were trying to solicit donations from the churches to help support these people. So we know that people knew that Topeka and Kansas were safe. And I think that there's a great story in just that. The notion that um, although the United States finds itself in a period of intense violence, there are islands of safety in islands of progressivism uh, that exist even in 1919. And the message that people shouldn't, that I don't want people to take away from this, and, and a lot of students ask me, well, why should we learn about this? Because it only paints white people as bad characters. And I'm like, no, it does not. Um, there are a number of people who take very, very courageous stances like the governor of Kansas and like Kansas's senator um, to protect uh, the people uh, who are fleeing. And there are men like Robert Curlin, who was a retired colonel that is teaching at Virginia Military Institute that will stake his whole career on writing a letter uh, to support the people of Elaine and put down the idea that there is a, a a violent revolution of foot and the school will let him go and the reason the school gives for letting him go is that he betrayed the race by not sticking with the storyline so there there you know there are good you know there are good stories that can come from this and um there are you know not every white person in the in the nation or in the state are villains in the story. There are a lot of really good people who stood up. And uh, unfortunately, many of those people suffered uh, severe consequences for standing up. You, you might mention Ulysses Bratton, who was the lawyer who was supposed to represent the sharecroppers in the first place. Uh, you know, his son was down there at the time of the massacre and was held in jail for the longest time. And there were worries that he was going to be lynched and, you know, Bratton had had a long history of battling peonage in the state, you know. So here's, here's a native son born, I want to say it was Searcy County, um, who had a long history of civil rights activism as a white man. So and he was, he was a former Confederate, wasn't he? You're, I think you're thinking George Murphy. Murphy, right. Right. Yeah. Who was a former Confederate and a former Attorney General who ended up signing on to the uh, defense of the Elaine Twelve. So, you know, there there are any any number of heroes we can draw out of this. Um, you know, we don't have to see ourselves as the mob. You know, or, or and you know, we we have we have ancestors. That, that we can we can uh, celebrate just 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 as we have we have ancestors you know on the, in the Civil War we can celebrate not every Arkansan uh, pledged fealty to the Confederacy well um, I've got another question if you if you've got time there's sure. another question in the uh, chat from Julia um, if someone could speak to the slave codes and they're similar to any present day situations maybe. And when you say the slave codes, um, could you give me, Julia, could you give me a little bit more detail? Um, maybe while Julia is typing out her uh, response, there's another question and I was curious about this myself, a, a question from uh, Sabine. How is the massacre remembered in Elaine now? Um, what is it like to be a black person there today? I did post in the chat a link to the Facebook page of the descendants of the Elaine massacre that I urge people to check out. Uh, 
people who have family ties to the Elaine massacre are doing, uh, put, putting on events and organizing and trying to uncover uh, like their own familial history with that and, you know, also begin to talk about it because, uh, you know, we, we did an event um, a few weeks back when one of the descendants was, was there talking about how she had not heard about the massacre growing up and only heard about it after the publication of Griff Stockley's original book and went to ask her grandmother for details. And that was the first she'd heard, you know, first she realized that she had a family connection to that. Uh, but Brian's talked to several of the descendants I'm also working on a project this semester with a group of students at Berkeley, journalism students that have been um, interviewing the survivors' families and trying to piece together, you know, what what is the collective memory of the event? How has the event, or at least the memory of the event, shaped their lives? And um, do they believe that they are still affected? Do they live in the shadow of the massacre? And what has it meant for those families to live in the shadow of this tragic event? Um, is there a any kind of memorial at this point? You said the descendants are working on on something. Is is there? Is there anything or has, has there been at some point in time uh, commemorating the Elaine massacre in, in the region? There, there was the installation of a memorial in Helena last year with the centennial uh, of the massacre. Um, there's also group in Elaine the Elaine Memorial, oh, I'm going to forget the name, Elaine Memorial Center, Elaine Legacy Center, okay. uh, that has been carrying out programming uh, to commemorate the massacre. And like I said, the, the descendants um, are, Brian was able to get, and I'll let him talk about that, a plaque up at Little Rock National Cemetery and Uh, yes. Uh, one of the projects that the pub introduction of public history class did and over the last couple years were to try to piece together the past of the, the lives of the Elaine 12 as they emerged from prison. Um, we feared that most of them would be, uh, we'd be unable to find. We figured that many of them, like Robert Lee Hill, were likely living under aliases and had moved out of the state to avoid uh, reprisals uh, by the white from the white community. Uh, and in doing this, we found a wealth of information about uh, six of them. So we were able to identify six of the individuals, and we set about not only telling their stories and making sure that their their stories were included in the uh, Encyclopedia of Arkansas, but we also wanted to do something more. Uh, so we began uh, raising funds to uh, create a foundation to uh, put up markers at their grave sites. And we put up that first marker uh, this past spring and it commemorates uh, Frank Moore. Uh, and Frank Moore, if you remember, was one of the men who founded the, the Elaine branch of the union. And uh, he was a soldier. So uh, he was surprisingly easy to find. And very unexpectedly, he was in our backyard. So he was here, right here in Little Rock. He died in Chicago. Uh, he worked as a security guard. Um, after being released from uh, prison. He was no longer with his wife. Um, it appears that, and, and, and this is the case with uh, more than one of the 
the individuals that was married, their marriages did not survive um, this incarceration and being on death row. And, and we can imagine how hard that would be on a, on a family uh, having to uh, deal with this. Uh, they didn't have children. And uh, we know his wife's name was Mary Moore, but I haven't been able to figure out what happened to his wife whether she survived or died, or uh, whether she just moved on and uh, remarried, uh, believing that he would be executed. Uh, he dies in Chicago, and he's, his body is brought back here, and he, he is buried right in the National Cemetery of Little Rock, and it's a beautiful cemetery. And uh, I was really, really happy to see that he was in such a well cared for uh, cemetery. Some of the others that we found are in African, traditional African American cemeteries. And uh, many of the cemeteries aren't as well cared for. Uh, probably one of the more surprising uh, finds was that one man is in the, one of the men, uh, Albert, uh, Albert uh, uh, Childs is in, the same cemetery that Abraham Lincoln is buried in. So he's in Springfield. So uh, we're hoping to put a marker there. We're hoping to also put a marker at Haven Arrest for Joseph Knox, uh, the Dixon Cemetery and Father Dixon Cemetery in St. Louis, another cemetery in East St. Louis. We found another and we found someone in Ohio. So we're trying to uh, identify what happened to these individuals, make sure that there's some uh, recognition or commemoration and memorial that, that's put up on that site and uh, notify the families of the important role that these men played in American history. And a lot of you might ask, well, why should we remember uh, the Elaine Massacre. Well, the, the Elaine Massacre is important for a number of reasons. Uh, the NAACP tries a new strategy in Elaine, and that strategy uh, will be to use the 14th Amendment to try to uh, seek uh, civil rights justice. And for those of you who are familiar with uh, civil rights cases, um, that will be the platform that they will use for most of the cases in the civil rights movement will be that go to the Supreme Court will go there um, using the 14th Amendment. It's also a point when the NAACP breaks away from all of the other social justice groups in the country. We, we have to remember the NAACP isn't the only black, uh, isn't the only group that is looking out for blacks or, or arguing about lynching. But it's, it's during this case that um, the NAACP will create its grassroots movement that will propel it to being the premier civil rights um, and social justice organization um, in the country at the time. So I, I was a little upset that the, the NAACP didn't take uh, a more active role in the celebration uh, and commemoration and then the memory of these, these individuals because um, their success as an organization is so closely tied to these individuals that I believe that they, they owed at least some recognition to these individuals for what they had done. Agreed. Um, the the, the case and the uh, the Supreme Court rulings, you know, stemming directly from uh, the Elaine massacre. Um, I mean, really, like you said, set, sets a stage for future civil rights actions and and decisions. Um, I, I I'm also I'm not from Arkansas either, and I was curious if um, in you know in the you know ninth grade state history. Uh, is is this something that is uh, in the textbooks, or um, is this something that's that's covered in Arkansas history at the you know junior high high school state history level? And um, you know the more 
if not, maybe the more that is is learned, um, is it is it something that's going to be in there? Do they have any idea, either of you, on on that front? We live in strange days, <laughs> um, as we talk about patriotic history and um, ending diversity discussions in workplaces. Um, at the same time, I'm working with a number of groups and individuals throughout the state to really make sure that teachers are uh, learning these difficult histories and telling, uh, teaching these difficult histories in the classroom. And um, for a while, the state was, was very, very receptive to it. I don't want to say the state is, hasn't been, but I sort of fear what's on the horizon uh, with this move, this discussion of, of a move toward um, histories that uh, are, are kinder and gentler. Um, American history hasn't been uh, very kind and gentle all the time. And it seems that we're, we're totally comfortable talking about World War I as a bloody, uh, a bloody event, or World War II, or the Civil War, the American Revolution. But when it comes to um, racialized violence or anything that's difficult about race, uh, we want to sweep that under the rug. And I, I fear that uh, that might be a, an issue in the near future. Uh, the governor has been really open to at least uh, the placement of markers and making sure that um, uh, the Heritage Department works alongside us, works in, alongside us with uh, these projects that we've done, and they've been very, very helpful. And I hope that that continues in the future, but um, the political landscape is a little strange these days. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I, I'm sure we could keep talking and <laughs> discuss uh, various aspects of this, uh, but it has, it's at 720. So um, unless there is any you know further questions or, or comments from you guys? I go ahead and let you call it a an evening. I mean, we we could talk about this all night, but yeah. So if you guys have additional questions, we'd be happy to take them. Um, uh, feel feel free to email me, email Brian. Our email email addresses are public so yes yes thank you thank you for that offer um wonderful information and uh i've got to have my name on hold for the book because our, our copies are checked out at the library <laughs> <laughs> so well, um as pointed out, my the, turn. Book, the book is on sale right now so if anyone uh, would like to purchase a book. I believe it's just over twenty dollars right now. Mm -hmm. So you could purchase a book for uh, twenty um, twenty bucks and, and some change right now. And in fact, many UA Press books at this moment are on sale if you order through their site. So the more you buy, the more you save. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. That's a great idea. <laughs> well. Um, if I get any questions directed my way, I'll be, be sure to, to pass them along. I appreciate the, the wonderful information and the, the scholarship and, and your, your sharing your, your uh, information and studies and research with us. Uh, really can't thank you enough, uh, both of you, for being here. Um, I'll just say thank you one last time and good night and goodbye. Thank you everyone for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you. And we'll do this physically in Fayetteville when that's possible again. That's, that sounds great. Would love it. Thank you. Bye-bye.